And so being here, it means a lot to me. So thank you very much for choosing to be here this morning. Now, we're not going to be starting our new series this morning. I know last week I told you that uh, when it would be, but many times, you know, you sleep uh, before we talk again and you don't always remember what I say. And we're starting the new series next week. And the new series is titled Seven Things to Totally Do to Definitely Destroy Your Life. And um, I told you I would come up with a shorter title, but I'm not going to because I like that one a lot. And so we're just going to stay with it. And I'm going to try to say it the same way every time. Seven things you can totally do. Now, I may change that word for definitely. I haven't decided yet. Maybe we could vote. Seven things you should totally do to definitely destroy your life. And we don't want to destroy our lives. So we'll be talking about things that we should not do. But we're going to have some fun with it. Today, we're going to be talking from the book of James, and I'm going to be giving you some background, some foundational information, connect some dots perhaps, about what this whole life change or transformation is all about. We have talked every week since January, the beginning of January, about how we're going to grow, how we're going to transform, how God is doing something in us that may be new, it may be different, it might be unexpected, but that we're not going to be the same people at the end of the year that we were or then we were at the beginning of the year. And in January, all of us or many of us raised our hands and said, you know, I'm not the person I want to be or ought to be. And this year I want God to change me into the person he wants me to be. Whether you were doing a pretty good job in January, if we're comparing ourselves not to each other, I might be better than you in some ways, spiritually. You may be stronger than me some ways, but we don't compare with each other and we don't try to beat each other. We compare ourselves to Jesus. And when we do that, none of us measure up. So all of us say, you know, I I need to improve. I need to grow. I need to transform. And so during this this last year, we've talked about everything from spending, I mean, uh, we spent over two months on love from 1 Corinthians 13, breaking it down, you know, concept by concept, learning what that really means. We talked about how to connect with our family, how to earn influence. I mean, we've been through themes. We've been through weeks that have been hard sometimes to listen to as far as how personal they are. Sometimes we've had some fun with some of the weeks because it's been a little lighter, but we've been through a journey together. At the end of this year, we're going to celebrate what God's done in our lives, but until then, we're going to keep moving forward. So we're rounding the corner into fall. We're going to finish strong as we look just at the last few months of this year. Today, I'm talking to you um, from the book of James. Now, as a review for some and maybe new information for others, James was the half-brother of Jesus. And James, during Jesus' life, uh, was not a Christ follower. He didn't believe in Jesus, which is a little weird because you'd think if you grew up in the home with Jesus, you would believe in Jesus, but he did not. He was Jesus' half-brother. And in Mark, early in the book of Mark, it talks about a story where Jesus actually had his family come and try to get him and take Jesus with them almost by force because the things Jesus was saying, the claims he was making, uh, he was drawing too much attention. They wanted to protect Jesus from himself. And James was probably one of those people. Now, James had an encounter with Jesus after Jesus rose again and decided to become a Christ follower. And not only did he become a Christ follower, but he became a devoted Christ follower, not just a man who says he's a Christian, but a man who was Christ-like, allowing Jesus to be part of all of his life. He became a leader in the church in Jerusalem. He was somebody that people looked to when they had disputes or questions about how to live their lives spiritually. They wanted advice or questions. And James wrote a letter probably one of the first letters that was written in all of the New Testament, because the only people who are mentioned are Jews who'd become Christians and not even Gentile Christians yet. And we know that Gentiles became Christians very quickly, but he wrote a letter to Jews who had become Christians who were scattered in some cases against their will. They in many cases, grew up in the same synagogue with the same families. They knew each other circumstantially. They knew each other relationally. They'd been together. They'd seen each other's kids come up. They had a lot in common. They had community. And all of a sudden, many of them had no more community. They were separated. They were in hostile environments where their faith wasn't one that was shared by many people who lived around them. And they wondered how to live. 
And so James being very practical, in fact, James is often called the Proverbs of the New Testament because reading James is so similar to the book of Proverbs in theme and in instruction. Uh, it's just so practical. And we pick up in the fourth chapter of James today, out of five, the fourth chapter of James in a section of scripture where James is giving an illustration or an example of a businessman. Now, before we get into this and read this together, the illustration is simply of that of a businessman. But that is not the only application. A businessman just happens to be what this person in this illustration did. But it could just as easily be a mother. It could be a career mom. It could be a dad. It could be a stay-at-home dad. It could be a grandpa. It could be a grandma. It could be a child. It could be a student. It doesn't matter the application. It's a person who has responsibilities, who has a life. It would represent all of us here. The illustration that James gives is simply that of a businessman, but the principles apply to each and every one of us. So we're gonna dive in together and we're gonna look at this. It's found in James chapter four. In James chapter four, verse 17 is the key to what we're studying, but we're not gonna get to that key until the second part of my message. It says, James chapter four, verse 17, when you know what you should do and you don't do it, it's sin. And that's a hard one. It doesn't mean that when we don't know what we're supposed to do that we're not responsible, but it does mean that once we know what we're supposed to do and we choose not to do it, well, that really represents a condition of the heart that we should be conscious about or careful with. So let's read it together. And we'll dive in and I think we'll have some fun. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. Now you who say is significant. In fact, I'm really supposed to cover this in a second, but I'm gonna stop and cover it right now because it is a significant way or part of understanding this passage. So James says, listen up, you who say. You who say, the word Lego literally means those of you who have looked at life who have logically and rationally made a decision, who've arrived at a conclusion as to this is the way I should live. Does that make sense? Not a person who haphazardly says, okay, this is just the way things ended up, but a person who said, this is my life. These are my choices. This is what I'm going to do. It's been thought out, a conclusion. You know what a conclusion is, by the way? It's the last thought you think when you're done thinking. That's a conclusion. A person who's thought their last thought because they were done thinking and has concluded that this is what they're going to do. Now, let's move on and read the rest of it. Now listen, you who have concluded, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city and we'll spend a year there. We'll carry on business and we'll make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now it is September, can you believe that? It's already September. I don't know where the summer went. And I think every year I say that. And I think people, as we get older, we say that more and more. Um, I don't know if it's just a thing to say or if it's just a scary reality, but I mean, life is a vapor. It's over. And pretty soon in the morning when we walk outside, it'll be cold. And when we breathe, there'll be a vapor. And then what does it do? It goes away immediately. And that's what life is like. I was reminded of that just this last Friday is I did a memorial for a man in our church, Dave Hamlin. He passed away at 80 years old, a retired police chief. He'd spent 34 years serving Urbandale Police Department, sat right back there about three rows from the back, stage left, maybe 50 or 60 law enforcement personnel here, a full room of people talking about the life of a man who lived eight decades, but I promise you at the end of his life would have told you that it went just like that. I look at my kids today, 29 and 26, and remember them the day they were born. And I cannot believe 29 years has gone by. And James says, listen up. We're gonna come back to this in a minute. Life is a vapor here one second and gone the next. So we don't even know what's gonna happen tomorrow. We're a mist that appears for a little while. And then he offers an instead. 
Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, then it is sin for them. Now let's move on and dive right into this. The problem is not what the business person said, not what the stay-at-home mom said, not what the career mom said, not what the stay-at-home dad or the career dad said, not what the husband said, not what the wife said, not what the grandparents said, not what the students said. The problem is not with what is said because everybody has a life and we're supposed to think it through and we're supposed to make plans. We're supposed to have an idea of where things are heading. We're supposed to not just get up and live by vision, by whim, by circumstance. The problem isn't with what was said. The problem was with what, boy, that's a lot, isn't it? Wasn't said. He left something out. She left something out. They left something out. Their planning and their agenda, their calendar did not include God. They chose the time, today or tomorrow. How presumptuous. They chose the location, this or that city. How presumptuous. They chose the timetable, a year. They chose the job, a particular career, a business, a vocation. What if God had a plan? What if it was a different plan? It didn't matter. They had chosen for themselves. They chose their goal, which was to make money. And once again, there's not anything wrong with what this, well, it's a story. It's an illustration. The man didn't really live. It was a story to make a point with what they said. The problem was with what they didn't say, with what they left out with who they left out. Now there's a difference between being a man or a woman or a kid who says they're a Christian and being a man or woman or kid who's a Christ follower. And many people say, I'm a Christian and they tip their hat toward God and maybe even show up on Sunday morning from time to time, maybe toss a check in the offering plate every once in a while and say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they've compartmentalized their life so much that their Christianity is almost a place they go or part of their identity, but it's separate from their parenting, separate from what they do with their time, separate from what we do with our money, separate from how we spend our thoughts. And yet we say we're a Christian, but we live as practical atheists. And a practical atheist says, Yeah, I believe there's a God, but I really don't care a whole lot about what he says about my life. Well, you say, I would never say that. Well, you don't have to say it. We live that way by compartmentalizing. Christianity, a Christ follower is who we are. And it should characterize and permeate every single part of our life, which means the decisions we make which means the way we parent, which means the way we conduct ourselves at work, which means that it should definitely characterize the relationship we have with our spouse or we have one, our dating relationships, kids to kids, parents to kids, grandparents to kids. There's no part of life that our relationship with Jesus should not inform and shape because that's part of transformation. But this business person didn't give God their lives. They lived as a practical atheist saying, this belongs to you, God, but I got the rest. I know where I'm going. I know where I'll be. I know where I'm heading. This is what life is gonna bring. And James is presenting to us the tragedy of living for self. The problem is we don't know anything about tomorrow. Nothing. We try to control tomorrow. We try to predict tomorrow. We try to assume what's going to happen tomorrow. But none of us have a clue what's going to happen tomorrow. But many times we play God. 
And by acknowledging that, that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but certainly God does, that perhaps he has a plan and a purpose, perhaps he's in control, where it leads us to two passages of scripture. And this is, I'm almost done with the beginning section of my teaching. So just stay with me another couple minutes and we're going to arrive at the, at least the conclusion to the first half. It leaves us with two really important thoughts because we're human and sometimes we just ask simple questions. All right, Pastor Rick, you're saying a lot and I just need to know what's in this for me. What am I going to get if I do it, right? Now, you may ask those questions. Um, the disciples ask those questions. And Jesus was gracious enough to redirect and to correct them. Because it's not the right question to ask, but it's a human question to ask. It's a fair question to ask. What's in it for me? Now, following Christ in my opinion, is the only reasonable way to live. However, you have to choose. Proverbs and Psalms give us two things, two promises. In a sense, it's what's in it for you. But in the big scheme of things, it's what in it is in it, how we serve the Lord. First of all, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and here we go. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, there's a, a compound thought in this promise, and I'll tell it to you very quickly, because everybody wants the desires of their heart met, right? I want my heart's desires to be met. Now, the Holy Spirit, as we're transformed into different people, Romans 12, remember, don't be conformed to what the world wants you to do, to live compartmentalized, to live in a way where God isn't part of everything that you do, where you don't really care about what he wants for the other areas of your life besides that which is over here. Living that way is not what God intended. Delighting in the Lord, being transformed, literally means that God changes the desires of our heart. He changes the way we think. Don't be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And when our desires change, God meets those desires and we find that our heart is full. And many of our hearts are not full. Many of our hearts are empty. And you look around you and you see many people in your sphere, in your circle, in our world, with achy, empty hearts. And I would suggest to you that it's because we're not living the way that we were created to live. But the Psalms promises us that when we learn to honor the Lord, and I'm gonna talk about what that means in a minute, that he will give you the desires of your heart. And then Proverbs, we, we learn, trust the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding and all of your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. So two promises here, two reasons to just keep tracking with me in this, in this message, to stick around for the second part. The fulfilled and delighted heart and the life of the straight path. Well, what does that mean? What's next? Where am I gonna be in five years? What's my legacy going to be after I'm gone? I'm facing some decisions, some challenges, some questions. I don't always know what to do. That when we trust the Lord with all our heart, when we don't trust ourselves, but lean on him, he gives us a fulfilled and truly happy heart and makes the path in front of us that seems so impossible to figure out. Well, he makes it simple. Now, I wanna leave you with this thought because we're done with the first section. And it's gonna lead us into what we talk about in just a minute after we sing. You have to choose what you're about, what your life is about, what your relationships are about, your family, your career. You have to choose. But people who are consumed with themselves, and I'm gonna say it to this side now, people who are consumed with themselves. How about this side right now, in the middle? You tracking with me? Until you smile at me and nod, I'm gonna keep saying it over and over again. That's, that's the thing. People, I'll say it online, who are consumed with themselves end up consuming themselves. And everyone around you pays the price. 
So we're going to talk about that in a second. I've already reminded you once today, I want to remind you again, all of us started January, if we started January together. Many of you have come uh, sometime after January and begun this journey with us. Maybe this is your first week. It's okay. You're with us. We're doing it together. But we all raise our hands and say, I have work to do. I compare myself to Jesus. I don't measure up. I want to grow. I want to be transformed. So what I'm talking to you about is, um, can be difficult, it can be overwhelming. And the tendency is, is just to say, you know, I'm bad at it, so I'm gonna quit. And that's the tendency in every area of life, but it's certainly not one that will get us anywhere. I was thinking about a time not too long ago when uh, I went to the gym and there, well, it was a kind of gym, well, I, my schedule I, is a little bit weird. I like to get up in the morning and work for a couple hours, you know, and then about nine o'clock or so, 9.30, I like to go into the gym when it calms down so that there aren't tons of people there, but there are old people there. And there's nothing wrong with old people. I'm probably considered, I know, I'm probably considered old people in a lot of gyms. I get that. But, um, but, and there, but there's old people. And when, I'm, when I get to be what I consider to be old, which is not yet, it's someday, I want to be in the gym. So I love it when they're, I mean, it's not that I'm, I'm not criticizing. I'm just stating a fact. They were older than me. They were in the gym. This is the kind of gym that plays soap operas and stuff. Sometimes if somebody has the clicker on the TVs that they have all over the walls, also Fox news with the, you know, the news ticker. And if you look carefully, you can find ESPN. And this old man older than me was sitting on a machine that I wanted to use, which is why I was annoyed and paid attention in the first place. He was in my way. First, it's no problem because you share. After 20 minutes, it becomes obnoxious. He was sitting there on the machine. It was the shoulder press machine, the only one they had in the whole gym, and he would not move. He was just watching TV. I'm like, dude, go home, watch TV. Watch it on your phone in the locker room. You've got to go. I didn't tell him to leave because that's rude. I just went up and stood there and stared at him. He didn't care. <laughs> the only thing that got him to move, this is a true story, was I didn't realize this. It was his wife. And you know, after I said this in the first service, I realized it may not have been his wife. It could have been his girlfriend. I don't know, right? Uh, but this woman who was on the treadmill starts to turn around and look at him. And as soon as he or she was starting to look at him, he immediately started doing reps really fast. And, and she goes, you've got to calm down. You've got to slow down. You're going to hurt yourself. And he goes, I'm doing it for you, sweetheart. You know, he's in the gym. And I was like, you liar. You know, I was so mad. I wanted to tell on him so badly that he was just trying to impress his wife doing nothing, right? But um, some people feel like that, you know, just going is enough. You know, I was there. I just go to the gym. It's enough. Um, it's a start, just like going to church, right? Well, I'm going, well, it's a start. It's a good start because that's where good things happen. But what matters is, is what you do while you're there and what you do from there as you go back to your life, just like the gym. What matters is not just what you do in there, but how you live out of there. And when your entire life becomes one of choices that begin to help you grow and transform and you begin to see progress, then you'll do anything you have to do to keep up that progress. And then it becomes something that comes from you that somebody's not telling you to do it. It's not just good for you. It's a choice. It's a commitment. It's a value that you have chosen. And that's when transformation begins. So we begin on a journey this year. And it's a value that many of us have chosen. And we know it's gonna be uncomfortable and we know we're gonna have to have hard conversations with ourselves and it's okay. We know we're in it together. and. Only the weakest of us is as strong as any of us are strong. We're only as strong as the weakest among us. We finish together. That's what we do. We're a family. So we go back to James chapter four. And we're going we're gonna to raise the standard a little bit because that's what the Bible does. It's okay. We're going to look at it together, measure ourselves up, and we're going to make some decisions to live differently. Let's go back to James together. The first problem we already talked about is we don't know anything about tomorrow. We don't know. Now, listen, you say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. What if God cares about where you are tomorrow? What if he cares about where you are, or where you live? What if he cares about how you spend your time or how you choose for your kids to spend their time? What if he cares about the business that you do or what and how you choose to make your money? The second thing that we see and we find is that we might not even be here tomorrow. Now, I alluded to that, and people don't like to think about that because it's hard to think about. We might not be here tomorrow. I mean, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What's your life? Remember, it's a mist that appears for a little while and, and then vanishes. 
Mortals, this is from Job, born of woman are a few days and full of trouble. They spring up like flowers and wither away like fleeting shadows. They do not endure. You know, times like we had here in Friday make people uncomfortable because we talk about or think about death. You got a room full of people who are all of a sudden talking about a person, saying a memory, a thought, a word that best describes them. And um, when I do memorials or funerals, I don't mind doing them, especially for believers like Dave was. But it makes me think hard about my own life. Now, I'll be perfectly frank with you, and this isn't from the Bible. It's just my own personal choice, my own personal decision. My wife says I'll be dead, so I don't get to choose anyway. But I don't want a funeral or memorial. I don't want to be, I just want to be cremated. I don't care. I don't want to be celebrated. I want my boys to sit around sometime and tell some stories about me. Hopefully they're true. I don't know. I don't want anybody to talk about the degrees I had or how big the church was I pastored or not pastored. I don't care about any of that stuff. What I care about is that I want to be remembered for somebody who loved the Lord who did their best, even though their best wasn't good enough, who cared about the people who were around them or him and who died without regret. That's what I want. To me, that's success. The rest, I don't care. And I think in a sense, that may be what James is teaching us here. The Bible says many, many times what we do here on earth can be an offering to the Lord, but only what we take with us matters and really only what we leave behind are investments we make in the lives of the people that begin with the people closest to us. And so James goes on to talk about this and he does it here in this next section. And he says, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we live and do this or that. And I want to tell you how you know whether something's the Lord's will. Now, this is not in your notes. This is a bonus. It's just uh, I don't know, you're here. I want to share it with you because it's important to me. Now, there are other ways to know what God's will is. This is not comprehensive, but this is part of it, okay? There are three things, three things that are important to know. When I'm looking at my life, my choices, my calendar, the way I spend my money, the way I choose to use my thoughts, these are the things. This is how we know whether or not we're lined up with God's will. Number one, is this making God proud or making God happy? No excuses. Well, I'm busy, God. Well, I have other commitments. Well, of course, Lord, I live in a world that, you know, is uh, competing for my time and my thoughts and my schedule. I don't have enough money to make ends meet. We make all kinds of excuses, but at the end of the day, is the way I choose to live, is it making God proud? Is, he make, is it making God happy? Secondly, is it contributing to my spiritual transformation? Is the way I live contributing to my wife's spiritual transformation? And if she were here and she's back with the kids this service, she would say the same thing. Is the way I live contributing to my husband's spiritual transformation? Is the way I relate to him? Is the way I relate to her? Helping her become more a woman of God or less? Is the way I parent my kids, the way I crowd their schedules, the things I tell them are important? Is it helping to accomplish their goals as becoming men and women of God or is it taking away from that? Because Romans 12 tells us it's one or the other. You can't have both. And then third, if the people around me closest to me, my friends, my kids, my church family, if they gave the same way I did, if they thought the same way I did, if they spent their time the same way I did, I would have a vibrant, healthy church family that would reach this world for Christ and be an unstoppable force in the hands of the Lord? Or am I just standing back waiting for somebody else to live that way so that I can reap the benefit? You see, there's hard choices that we make and it's personal, but some of us just start by going to the gym and that's okay. We just go, we just get there. We watch TV, it's fine for a time. But at some point we have to begin to progress. And this year has been about progressing. And remember, you're not alone. So, man, it says, James says, the Holy Spirit says through the pen of James, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. Now, this boast in your arrogant schemes is a word picture. It's like, um, you ever watch the old Westerns where you always have a snake oil salesman and they put some kind of a box out in the middle of town square and they stand on it. And they're like, if you have saddle sores, this ointment will take care of it. If you have a headache, this ointment will take care of it. You're like, well, that's the same ointment. He's like, yeah, north, south, east, or west, doesn't make any difference. This will take care of anything you got. You can drink it, you can rub it on your sore muscles. Everybody knows it's not true, but the person standing up there, 
Well, they're selling lies. They're writing checks they can't possibly cash. They're making promises that they don't have the ability to follow through with because we don't control tomorrow. And we don't even control if we are here tomorrow. So instead we say, if it's the Lord's will, I'll live my life consistent with the Lord's will. One of the things that challenges me to my core is if my kids live the way I live, if they're as committed to the things of the Lord as I am, will they be men of God who raise Christian families of God? I mean, I've got enough to be able to just decide, am I doing it the way God wants me to do it? If it's the Lord's will, I'll say, God, I'm gonna do this tomorrow. I'm making plans. I have thoughts. I'm projecting into the future, but you control my days. You control the circumstances in life. And then this last phrase here is so important and I'm gonna, I'm gonna translate it for you as we go. For those of us who make these bragging, boastful statements about our lives, only consumed with ourselves. All such boasting, we're living our lives just like Satan. That's literally what that means. If you wanna live like the devil, then live your life that way because it's what caused him in the first place to be cast from heaven. I mean, James is turning it up. I mean, Jesus, half-brother, you'd expect him to be able to preach, right? And I mean, I've been living with this all week as I've been studying, going, good gracious, man, take it easy, right? I need a little bit at a time. This is intense. Well, let's read another passage of scripture quickly um, to sort of cut the tension. And um, this is a passage that you're gonna hear about again in a few weeks when we jump into our series. So I'm just kind of priming the pump. We've studied this before. We're taking it from a different perspective in this series. Think about and count how many times I, me, or mine are used here, just so you kind of see the point of a person consumed with themselves. Jesus said, watch out, be on your guard against all kind of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then Jesus told them this story. The story didn't really happen, but Jesus really told it to illustrate a point. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. This guy made plans and he got rich. I mean, he was rolling in it. The American dream, although he didn't live in America. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Pat yourself on the back, take it easy, retire. Vacate, get a hobby, spend some time on you, work on yourself. Whew. Oh, let's go back. I wasn't finished. I, I pontificated in the middle of that. I, we got to go back to that screen. Yep. I got to stay focused. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now let's move forward. But God said to him, You fool, this very night, wasn't the night the guy expected? Wasn't the night any of us would have chosen? This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? All of your degrees, all of your money, everything else, all of it, gone. Your kids will say, thank you. They'll spend it. Your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever's priorities are here on this earth. In this case, he's talking about stewardship, stores up things for themselves, but is not rich or generous toward God with thoughts, with time. And with money. You ever heard the statement, full of yourself? You ever been told you're full of yourself? You ever thought, well, that pastor's full of himself? Not, not this pastor, another pastor, a different church maybe you were at. Of course, you wouldn't think that about me, I hope. Um, full of themselves. You hear it a lot. Oh, they're just so full of themselves. And, and I want to talk about that for a second because you have a choice in life. You can choose to be full of yourself and you can teach your kids to be full of themselves and all the goals you set for them and all the time that you allocate for them and everything you arrange for them can be 100% consumed on trying to develop themselves. 
And self is not bad. You, yourself, your life that you've been given, your humanity deserves dignity and respect because you're created in the image of God. You're a wonderful, amazing person. God has a plan for you. If you don't have a relationship with God, he wants a relationship with you. If you do have a relationship with God, he has a destiny in mind for you. Yourself is not bad, but yourself, friend, is not enough. So here, listen to this if you've listened to nothing else so far. A person who is filled with themselves is only half full because you can never fill yourself 100%. 100% of yourself is only half of you. And the other half, you can never fill, but we try. And if God and our relationship with him through Jesus Christ is not filling us, then that hole that we have in us, we choose to get in many other ways. And we can fill our bank account. We can fill our garage. We can fill our house. We can fill a storage unit. We can fill a bedroom, but we can't fill a soul. And the problem is we teach our kids that because they live a self-centered life with a self-centered family. And they work on themselves and they develop themselves and then they leave our home half full. And then they go to college or the next step, half empty. And they look to everything the world has to offer to fill what it is that we should have given them had we been more intentional and raising them in a way where they could be part of a family who serves the Lord and not just a family who says they're a Christian family. I mean, this is a lot, but they're choices that we make. Um, in James, or John 3, 13, 17, Jesus sort of reiterates, or I'm sorry, John sort of reiterates what James taught us in John 4.17, James 4.17. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. And as I've mentioned to you, there are three ways to know what we really care about. Three things we should check. This is it. Checks. I always check myself. Always. Always check myself. You check yourself. What do I think about? What do I spend my time thinking about? The way that I check myself is, um, what do I think about right before I drift off at night when I go to sleep? And I don't know about you, but I mean, this is just me being transparent because after all, we're all doing this together. When things are right between me and God, when things are right in my life and my relationship, I look forward to thinking about God, thinking about my life with him, my relationship with him. Scripture, praying, you guys, whatever. Right before I go to sleep. First thing I think in the morning, oftentimes, when things are right between God and me, is man, God, I wanna get today right. I need your help because I'm not going to get it right, but I, I really want to get today right. Now, when things aren't right between God and me, I sort of try not to make eye contact like a dog who's gone to the bathroom on the floor and you know they went, but they don't want you to know that they've gone. And you look at them and they look away, right? And you, they look away. That's kind of how I feel. What do I think about? What's important to me? Do I find myself thinking about myself, my world, my job? Or do I find myself thinking about others? Do I find myself thinking about the things that God cares about that make him proud? Do I find myself thinking about things that are gonna make me more like Christ? Do I find myself thinking in ways that if everyone else around me thought the way I do, we would be more Christ-like and our church would be amazing. What do I spend my money on? Same thing. Am I waiting for somebody else to do it? Because I just really don't want to? How do I spend my time? Well, Let's conclude, let's try to land this plane because we've pretty much gone through what James has to teach us. And I wanna remind you that none of us wanna live our lives like practical atheists. A practical atheist is a person who looks at their life and says, my calendar's mine, God. And when it's convenient, I'll give you some time on Sunday, but don't ask for anything else. After all, God, I live in a busy world. I'm a busy man, I'm a busy woman. I have busy kids, I have a busy schedule. I got things I wanna do. A practical atheist says that they believe in God, might even say that they're a Christian, but spins and thinks and plans in a way that makes no allowance for it at all. Or we can choose to be men and women of God, not just a man or woman who says they're a Christian, but a man or a woman or a kid 
who is Christ-like and growing in our faith. And just like a person who's consumed with himself consumes themselves and the people who are around them, a person who is consumed with Christ, man, you talk about the overflow, not just in your own heart, the delighted heart, not just in your own path, the straight path, but in the lives of those who look to you to see what life is all about and how they should live. All right, we're turning the corner. We're almost there. Fall, man, next week we start the new series, right? Seven things to totally do to definitely destroy your life. I don't want you to miss it because we're gonna finish well. We're gonna celebrate well in December and we're gonna turn right back around. I know it's a spoiler and we're gonna start all over again in January, but together we do it for God's pleasure and man, it's a lot of fun. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together and I just pray that you would be with us as we consider these things. And uh, thank you for the teaching of James as inspired by your Holy Spirit, you, given to us even on this day, this holiday weekend where it's so easy to think about and do other things. And I pray, Father, that we would just allow you to speak to us as I prayed earlier today, that there would be a, a moment, a meeting that you have arranged between yourself and us, just the two of us, where we may be faced with some decisions that we have to make, that we might have to be honest with you and with ourselves, that we may have to make uh, some adjustments, we may have to confess some sin, we may have to resolve to live a different way. But even saying that, we can't do it ourselves. We don't have the strength. But you teach us over and over and over again in your word that with our resolve, our decision, plus your strength, your direction, your guidance and your plan, that you will transform us into something amazing for your glory and the benefit of the world around us. That's what we want as individuals and that's all we want as a church. And I pray it with confidence in Jesus' name, amen.